five, six, and... Vacation Family Content, it's a name that we totally made up. Thank you. You're welcome. Frank Herbert's sci-fi epic, Dune, is a novel of absolutely massive scope and scale. This massive scale is reflected extremely well in Denis Villeneuve's 2021 film adaptation of roughly the first half of the novel. Everything in this film is absolutely massive. Spaceships that seem tiny in space compared to their motherships are revealed to actually be massive in themselves when they land on the ground, dwarfing everything around them. I have actually heard the film be criticized for its large scale, with many critics such as David Ellerich saying things like, your television isn't big enough for the scope of this dune. But that's only because this lifeless spice opera is told on such a comically massive scale that a screen of any size would struggle to contain it. The center of this complaint seems to be that the massive scale of the film drowns out the emotional element of the story, a complaint that I have seen shared by many. I, however, wholeheartedly disagree. In my opinion, the scale of Villeneuve's Dune not only doesn't detriment the story and characters, but actually helps it. The massiveness of everything in the film is greatly important to Dune's themes, and expertly conveys the struggles that the characters are going through, and is essential to portraying these struggles in a cinematic manner. To figure out why the scale of the film helps tell the story so well, we have to look at what the actual themes and messages are. Frank Herbert's novel is so dense that it has many, many interpretations, but for this video, I of course will be going off the ones that I personally agree with. The reading that I align with with Dune is that Dune is, above all else, about systems of power, specifically in relation to charismatic leaders and how they should not be trusted. Paul's character is central to Dune's themes. Paul Atreides is an imperfect ruler who becomes venerated as a messiah despite ultimately being a human person with human failings, illustrating the inherent ridiculousness in venerating certain people and giving them positions of unbelievable power. Paul is a character who has immense supernatural powers, caused by thousands of years of planned breeding by the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood, uh, with the intent of bringing forth the Kwisatz Tadarak, which would be a being that brings power to the Bene Gesserit. Again, I must stress that the Kwisatz Tadarak is not the Messiah. The Bene Gesserit have planted the seeds among the people of Arrakis to believe that Paul is their prophesied Messiah, the Lisan al-Gaib, and the people of Arrakis believing this would allow the Bene Gesserit to take control of Arrakis and the Spice which would unlock incredible new powers for the Bene Gesserit when put in the hands of the Kwisatz Haderach especially. So really, the whole thing about Paul being a messiah is just the result of a plot by the Bene Gesserit to take power of essentially the whole universe. As stated, he who controls the spice controls the universe. Of course, this is all necessary plot information, but how does this actually play into the filmmaking of Dune Part 1? And what does the massive scale do for the film? Well, let's look at the three characters that the plot of Part 1 is most tethered to. Paul, Jessica, and Duke Leto. Duke Leto is a ruler of the immensely powerful House Atreides and must obey the Emperor's orders. Jessica is Leto's concubine and a member of the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood, meaning she must obey the Sisterhood, especially the Reverend Mother. Paul is their son, destined to be the Kwisatz Haderach through no choice of his own. Each of these characters is deeply tragic, as they are trapped within systems that allow them no chance to achieve what they actually want in life. Let's first take a look at Duke Leto Atreides. As we are shown of him personally, he is a very kind and charismatic leader, as well as a loving father. He tries his best to lead amicably and be a dutiful leader. He accepts the Emperor's wishes for the Atreides family to take control of Arrakis, despite fully knowing that it is a trap laid for his family to be destroyed by the Harkonnens. 
He believes that he can escape this, and he even believes he can bring positive change to Arrakis. The Atreides family still fully intends to continue the cycle of exploiting Arrakis' lands for spice mining purposes, but he believes that they will form an alliance with the desert nomads called the Freemen and work with them on amicable terms, rather than outright oppressing them like the Harkonnens did. However, this is still all just to cultivate what he calls desert power, a means for the Atreides to hold control over Arrakis. Duke Leto clearly wants to do good in the world, however, he is trapped in the Imperial system, and because of the inherent nature of his position, still must carry out the Empire's will of profit-motivated colonialism, no matter how much good he thinks that he personally can do. And in following the system, he is also being complicit in the petty politics that will lead to his own death at the hands of the Harkonnens. Now, let's take a look at Lady Jessica, concubine of Duke Leto and mother of Paul. Lady Jessica is not married to Duke Leto in order for him to be open to having politically advantageous marriages, but she does love him and Paul. Lady Jessica is an extremely powerful person. She was trained in the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood, essentially a cult of witches trained to have extremely unique powers to control others, and have spent thousands of years building power to control the Empire from behind the scenes. The center of their plan, like I said before, is the Kwisatz Haderach, a super being. The Bene Gesserit plan is to use a complex series of breeding that will take thousands of years to bring forth the Kwisatz Haderach, who will bring them ultimate power over the universe. Bene Gesserit sisters are able to control the gender of their child using their powers, and are only supposed to have daughters unless their child is the Kwisatz Haderach. Jessica, however, decides to have a son because of her love for the Duke, going against the Bene Gesserit plans. Her resistance of the sisterhood being motivated by love shows how she cares deeply for her family. However, she must condition Paul into being the Kwisatz Haderach so that the Bene Gesserit will allow him to live. She knows that being the Kwisatz Haderach is not what he wants in life, and she does not want to control him or condition him like the Bene Gesserit would want him to do, but she must protect him from the power of the Bene Gesserit. She loves her son, but in order to keep him alive, she must make sure that he is conditioned into being the Kwisatz Haderach despite what either of them want. She is essentially trapped inside the Bene Gesserit's web of political machination, torn between her love of her son and her loyalty to the Bene Gesserit. She is essentially stuck in a situation where she must make Paul someone that neither of them want Paul to be, or the Bene Gesserit will kill Paul. And finally, let's take a look at the story's protagonist, Paul. Paul is a young, charismatic heir to the Atreides family. Similar to his father, he wants to do good for his family and the world, and carry out his father's wishes of cultivating desert power through an alliance with the Freemen. He does not want to be the Kwisatz Haderach, and is uncomfortable with the murmurs of him being the Lisan al-Gaib. However, when his life is toppled by the Harkonnens and he meets the Freeman in the desert, he makes a transition into being exactly who the Bene Gesserit want him to be. He kills a man in ritual combat and accepts his role as the future leader of the Freeman as the Lisan al Gai, a role that he never wanted but is now willing to take due to his desire to destroy the Harkonnens. Because of the plot put into place by the Bene Gesserit, the Harkonnens, and the Emperor, Paul allows himself to submit to becoming an instrument of the Bene Gesserit's power. However, what does this have to do with the main thesis of the video? That the massive size of everything about Dune's production design actually tells the story, rather than just being a mere spectacle? Well, essentially, it is because of a very basic but very effective technique that Villeneuve uses in the film. Constantly throughout the film, we see these massive spaceships and structures. However, it isn't just the ships themselves that are important, it's the framing of them. Every single shot that shows some massive ship also has people in the frame framed in a way to show how they are absolutely dwarfed by the size of the structures around them. Even in the scene of Arakeen's destruction, where many of these large ships are being destroyed, 
it is only because of a even larger ship looming above them. This may seem unimportant, or maybe just for the sake of pure spectacle and wow factor, but it is vital to understanding the story and themes. The three characters that we looked at, who are the emotional cores of the film, are all in some way being crushed by the systems that they inhabit. Leto, by Imperial Systems of Power, Jessica, by the Bene Gesserit, and Paul, by both. These systems are complicated and huge beyond their comprehension, yet affect their lives in deeply personal ways. This is conveyed beautifully through the visuals, as the large structures and ships loom far above them and around them, just like the systems that entrap them. I really love how the film conveys this because it is so perfectly in line with Frank Herbert's commentary on governmental and societal systems, but it connects to the characters in a deeply personal way, explaining how Dune, with all of its complex politics and world building, is a deeply personal tragedy at heart. The incredible jaw-dropping visuals of the film aren't just there to look cool, they are deeply poetic in their design and framing, showing visually an emotional idea that will be much harder to convey in words. Alright guys, thank you for sitting through more of my conjecturing. It's good to be back. I will make sure to get some more videos out on a much more consistent schedule after my long hiatus, but I'm glad to be back, and I hope you're all glad to have me back, and if you like this video, give it a like, give it a comment, you know, maybe something nice, maybe something constructive, uh, either way, keep it polite and respectful of others, and please subscribe if you like this video. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.